Chapter 6 I pulled over on the side of the road as soon as I heard the sound of praise crying. What's wrong? I asked, without looking at the young woman sitting next to the driver's seat. I had picked up on Prey's unusual demeanor in the first place. She was still in her bank staff uniform as I had just picked her up from her office. She covered her face in her hands, sobbing. I let out a long sigh. Prey? I already know everything, Bun. Her beautiful, tear-streaked eyes turned towards me abruptly, her gaze filled with anger. I frowned. You know what? Why did you have to do this? How many women have been deceived by you? Don't you feel pity for me? Prey spoke in a loud voice. I was about to open my mouth and ask what the heck she was talking about, but she cut in. What did I do to deserve this? Why did you have to deceive me? Wait, what are you talking about? I don't understand. The fact that you're gay, bun. And you date women for cover. My heart nearly stopped right then and there. I didn't know where she gets this information from. What are you talking about? Well, I know it from your ex, Bun. He is a friend of my friend. He happened to know that you and I are dating, so he warned my friend to tell me. She lifted her sleeves and wiped her eyes. I sat still, trying to process what she had just told me. My ex, huh? Since I moved here to serve under the government, it was true I had been involved with many people. However, women I had been in a relationship with were Kai, the ER nurse, and Prey, the one who was crying next to me. I didn't think Kay knew that I was gay. The reason I broke up with Kay was that we were too different, and she said she found me unapproachable. And you believe that? My eyes fixed on the street bathed in the evening sunlight. I'd been racking my brains to find the identity of the person who had told on me. The name of one person popped in my mind despite the fact that our history had ended more than ten years ago. Tar. I don't want to believe it, but the things my friend has told me, it made me lose my trust in you. I said nothing, and naturally I should have appeared more in shock than anything else. Surprisingly, I was calm quite unperturbed by Prey's words. I didn't give a thought to the woman crying next to me as I was mulling instead over the unknown person who claimed to be my ex-lover and told Prey's friend on me. Moving to work in a remote province made me think that I would be able to leave everything behind. I never would have thought that the past would come back and haunt me here of all places. I'm not gay, but if you're upset, by all means, you can break up with me. I spoke with a stoic tone of voice. Prey turned to look at me, a stunned expression washed over her face before bawling her eyes out. After all this time, I never understood. What's on your mind, bun? Prey said while sobbing. It's like you have been carrying some sort of secret all the time. This too. Stop lying to me. Stop deceiving women, please. Can you promise me you won't do this again? Let me be the last woman you would ever betray. I reach for the glove compartment in front of the seat next to mine and open it, pulling out the Kleenex and handing it to Prey. I'm sorry. To me, saying that was like a confession to every allegation put on me. Prey took the Kleenex from my hand and dabbed her crimson face with it. I can't continue our relationship, bun. I know. I leaned my head against the headrest, exhausted. At the moment, I felt guilty. I was hurting her badly. Prey turned to me and laughed dryly. You certainly seem unflappable, Bun. Prey sniffled, turning her gaze outside of the window. No need to pick me up tomorrow. Are we really going to break up because of the rumors your friend told you? I quickly asked in response. In part, yes. Another part is that I think it's not going to work out between us. You have your world, the one that I couldn't enter. And there's this. I honestly don't know what you are. But I don't want to stay like this anymore. Prey took off the necklace that I bought her for our sixth month anniversary. She held my hand and carefully placed the silver necklace in it. I closed my hands firmly around the necklace, looking down at my own hand, feeling empty. Once again, I was dumped by women. It was like I had been cursed since the day I broke up with Tar. As soon as I got home, I tried to find a way to contact the person who was likely the cause of my breakup. 
I hadn't seen Tara since I entered the university. It shouldn't be difficult to reach someone these days. Unfortunately, however, back when I was a teenager, mobile phones were not considered essential and the internet wasn't a part of everyday life. I have no idea how to get in touch with Tar. All I could do was type Tar's given name into the search tab. I remember that his given name was Nut and I. I tried to scroll down Facebook profiles of persons whose names were Nut and I in both Thai and English. It took almost an hour, but I couldn't find the one I wanted. Eventually, I gave up, even though somehow I managed to find a way to talk to Tar, finding how he knew about my relationship with Prey, knowing if he was still angry with me because of our past, it wouldn't change the fact that Prey and I had broken up. Then, I let this matter go. At least a good woman like Prey would be free from a hypocrite like me. She would meet someone new, a real man who would truly love her. It's a coronary artery occlusion. I looked down at the human heart, divided it into segments on the board. The main coronary arteries of the deceased were constricted entirely, which was a major cause that led to cardiac arrest and eventually death on the hospital bed. It was my job to determine the cause of death in all cases of a natural death. This elderly man wouldn't wake up in the morning during his stay in a special room in the hospital. He was given CPR for 30 minutes before his family decided to terminate resuscitation. Afterwards, his body was taken to me to determine the cause of death. I took off the gloves and threw them into the bin, taking off my lab coat before walking to write up a death certificate at the desk. You don't look fresh today, Dr. Bon. Anon, the middle-aged coroner, who was like my right hand, walked right up to me. Am I not? I replied. Perhaps I feel sleepy after lunch. Anon chuckled. You can joke around even when you're in a bad mood. I won't bother you anymore. Let's see the body and head home. I miss my wife. Then Anon marched straight to the pale, lifeless body of the old man lying on the steel table. I walked out of the forensic department after my job was done. My eyes drifted to the chair I sat on earlier today, recalling the words of the person who approached me while I was sitting in this very chair. What do I have to do to make you believe me? Tan asked lowering himself down in a chair next to me. He still wore a black shirt similar to the one he wore yesterday. What time do you get off work? I'll pick you up. We'll go out to supper. I was startled by his invitation. I didn't give him the answer. I didn't give him the answer, but Tan had made a precise prediction of his own that I should get off from work at a typical office hour. He said he would come to pick me up at 4.30 p.m and stated that while he was waiting for me to leave work, he would help out with Jane Jira's funeral, which was held at the temple not too far from the hospital. Please, I want to talk to you. There was no way I would hang out with the murderer. If I stepped into the car with him, I might end up being killed instead. My footsteps halted me in my tracks, and I contemplated about this. No, I shouldn't be scared that the murderer would kill me right now. He couldn't kill me. Not yet, because I had yet to issue an autopsy report to the police. Not only he couldn't kill me, he also could no longer hurt me. Because if he did, he would ultimately give himself away. I should use this advantage to approach him and find the evidence that would directly point to him. Decided, I returned to the front of the forensic department, thinking that I should carry something to protect myself for some reassurance. So I walked back to the autopsy room, furtively grabbing a scalpel blade from the envelope and a scalpel handle into my pocket, without letting Anon see it. He would throw a fit if he noticed the scalpel handle had disappeared. But I really needed it. When I walked back out to the door, I saw the tall figure of the man in the black shirt waiting for me. I stared at Tan's face, resisting the urge to rush forward yanking him by the collar and squeezed the bloody truth from the man before me. Tan looked relieved when he saw me. Thank you for coming with me. Where to? I asked. Wherever we can sit and chat. You can choose, cause you probably don't trust me if I'm the one who chooses the location. I trailed off, thinking for a moment. All right, we'll take my car. If you refuse, there will be no talk. Tan was slightly stunned before smiling softly. Whatever you say, doc. I drove Tan to a restaurant not far from the hospital. It was one of the most famous northern Thai restaurants in the province. I chose to come here because this restaurant was often crowded with people, both local and foreign, making me feel more secure. I turned into the parking lot in front of the restaurant. I had noticed that Tan kept glancing at me all the way we drove there. 
we didn't converse much. Tan might be reserving the talk to when we reach our destination. A waiter ushered Tan and me to sit at a table for two. As soon as I sat down on a chair, I cut to the chase. Okay, what do you want to talk to me about? Tan, who was flipping through the menu, paused slightly. You can eat spicy minced pork salad, right, Doc? This was not what I wanted to talk about. I displayed a grouchy face. Don't beat around the bush. We will talk, but it's probably not a good idea to leave the table empty. Allow me to order the meal for you. Tan raised his hand for the waiter, ordered three dishes of Thai local cuisine. Sticky rice or steamed rice? I sighed to ease the tension inside. Steamed rice. One more plate of steamed rice and oh, mild spice for the minced pork, please. Tan made the order in the fluent northern dialect before returning the menu to the waitress. The first thing I learned about Tan after meeting him face to face was that he was a local. What would you like to drink? I'll have a glass of water. Tan turned to look at me. Would you like a drink? Water. I observed Tan's demeanor under my unmoving scrutiny. After we had ordered the food, Tan turned back to me. His hands clasped on the table. His sharp, attractive features appeared placid and calm. I'm ready. Tan spoke to me with a more serious demeanor. So, what you said last night, was it true? What do you think? I threw back a question to avoid having to answer the question myself. Tan was stunned at my response. What do you want me to think? I suppose people like you wouldn't make things up just to play a prank on me. I suppose you actually have been threatened, and now you're trying to find the killer yourself. Tan went silent for a while before continuing. The reason I want to talk to you was that you suspected that I am the killer. I want to prove my innocence before it's too late. I frowned. What do you mean, too late? Before you run off to tell the police I have committed homicide, although I didn't do it, my life will become even more difficult than it already is, especially when it seems that you were well acquainted with the police. They would have believed you. Then I will be in very big trouble. Tan paused as the waitress walked by to pour water for us. When she walked away, he continued. I came here today with two objectives. One is to prove my innocence. Second is to help you find the culprit. If Jane really was murdered, and the police had been somehow involved in the delayed progress of the case, then I want to help you. This was probably an advantage of being a teacher. Tan was eloquent and credible. Still, I didn't trust this man. How can you prove that you didn't do it? Witness. Tan fished out his smartphone and tried searching for something on it. On the night of the 10th of December, I was at cram school, teaching until almost 7 p.m. From 7 p.m. to 11 p.m., I was at my friend's wedding at the Erwan Hotel. Hundreds of witnesses saw me there. The man turned his mobile phone towards me. He deliberately showed me photos of him and the wedding couple. After that, I went out to get a drink with three of my other friends. Tan wrote down the phone number of three people on the Kleenex tissue. I drank until 2 a.m., and then the four of us decided to go back to sleep over at this person's house. He pointed at the first number and handed me the tissue. You can call them. Everyone can confirm that I was with them. Afterward, I woke up at 10 o'clock and called Jane. She didn't answer my call. I was worried, so I went to her room. I knocked on the door for a long time, but there was no response. I was afraid that she would commit suicide because of her depression. Therefore, I ran to the staff and asked her to open the door for me, and you know the rest. What Tan had told me lined up with the information I learned from Captain Aim. I looked at the phone numbers with deliberation. What do you think, doctor? Is Jane's time of death matching the moment no one could confirm whether I was not alone? I'd estimated Jane Jia's time of death between 1 and 5 on the morning of December 11th which was when Tan went out to drink with his friend and returned to sleep over at his friend's. I'd like to call your friends first. I got up from the seat, picking up the Kleenex tissue and calling each person whom Tan claimed had stayed with him all night. Three of them answered my call and they all confirmed that Tan stayed with them. I returned to the table, utterly bewildered. All the food Tan ordered had been served. How did it go? Tan asked. You didn't practice this with your friend, did you? Tan let out a small laugh, which displeased me. You're rather untrusting, but I understand. If I went through something like that, I would be too, I guess. I huffed out a breath of irritation. How long has it been since I let my emotions show in front of others? I really couldn't hold it in. Fine, I believe you. 
Tan smiled in relief. Even if your face says otherwise, but hearing you say it like this makes me feel a little better. Tan took the food from the dish near him and reached out to place some on my plate. I can do it myself. Why did he have to do that? Did he think I would be impressed that he put the food onto my plate for me? He thinks I'm a woman or something? And what happened to your forehead? Did someone hit you? Or was it just an accident? Tan asked while putting rice into his mouth. What about the wound on your forehead? I shot back the question. The bruise on Tan's temple had started to turn greenish, which was the typical change. Tan felt silent, raised his hand to touch his forehead. Motorcycle crash. I didn't wear a helmet. I thought it was nothing serious, so I didn't go to the doctor. I didn't see a ride of motorbike, and so far I didn't see any injuries suggesting that it was a result of a road traffic crash. I drove the day before. Tan still looked calm, no sign of agitation in his gaze. By the way, I still don't know your name. What should I call you, Doc? He quickly changed the subject. I was still not entirely convinced with the wound on his forehead. However, he probably won't be honest with me. I'd wait for him to slip up, some sort of tell. Bunnikit. Yes, Dr. Bunnikit. My name is Tan. You probably know that already. Tan placed the silverware on the plate and reached for my hand on the table, catching me off guard. Let me help you find the killer, Doc. And this was what happened. My heart was racing for no reason whatsoever. I quickly snatched my hand away. My heart tended to act like this when I was with Tan. The first time it happened was at the crime scene. Initially, I thought it came from the excitement of my involvement in the crime investigation. The second time was at the crime school. And that time I thought my heart beat fast because of the fear I felt. And I was sure it must be because of fear as well this time. 